please welcome, nice warm welcome to Amir and Ryan. All right. Hello, Dublin. It's great to be here. Um, uh, this is going to be a great conversation with Amir. For anyone that's interested in scaling a business, as Matt said, it's hard to do once. It's really hard to do it twice. Amir started off in the you know, IDF and then started a company called Scioda, which didn't quite get to 100 million in revenue, but did get to some scale, and then went on to join a company called Optimize, which was part of Nice, a cyber business, which grew to 200 million in revenue under his tenure as CEO, and then uh, started a company called SciSense, which now is, what, 150 million ARR uh, larger. So uh, let's, let's get into it, and I think what we, what we thought we'd do is, instead of trying to talk about just how you scale one of these businesses, because you know, it's different at every stage, we thought we'd break it up first into you know, segments, in terms of talking about first that product market fit, that stage, maybe the next stage around getting the 25 million in revenue and what some of those elements are, then you know, getting from there to 100 and then beyond. And maybe you can talk about just compare and contrast you know, what worked in one situation, maybe what didn't work in the other, what are some commonalities across those different stages, and, and maybe set some of the context with, uh, with the businesses as well. Wow. All right. So maybe before I start, just the first tip is a lot of what I'll share is my own experience, sample of two, if you like, or three. And your job is to ignore half of it and adopt the, the other half, because every business is different. And that's really important to understand. You read all those tips and blogs and, and so on online, and it looks like there's a playbook. And it's somewhat true, but every business is different. To, so to your first point, I found the hard way that what worked extremely well in one business totally did not work at another and vice versa and knowing how to pick and choose this yeah, part I, of it. I think so often everyone thinks it's just it's a playbook. You just, you just yeah. follow this. Magic. Uh, Product market yeah. fits, scale, hire, <laughs> you're done. It yeah. didn't work that way, huh? Nope. <laughs> nope. Um, so let's see. First, the first stage we all know about is the product market fit, finding it. And the only two wise things I'll try and show with you is the first one is even when you find it, it goes away at some point when you scale. So the annoying thing is that finding product market fit does not, it's not an event and the last time you'll do it. You'll have to go and find it again and again when the market changes, you scale, and the competition change. So it's an ongoing thing. And the second thing, unfortunately, which I've seen almost at every company I've been involved in, you cannot hire or outsource that task. It's really annoying what I'm about to say, but you cannot hire the amazing VP sales or hire this perfect product person, and they will find it for you. It doesn't work. You have to find it yourself. As the founder, CEO, you have to find it yourself. And usually the hard way, we're just making mistakes till you get to the right one. That's usually the first stage, right? And you've seen it also many, many times. Yes. But then you have to scale the damn thing. And scaling is something I'm, I'm happy to say I've done now enough times. There's some repeatability. It's about getting the right people, obviously. It's about firing the wrong people that you have. It's about firing customers. When you look for that product market fit, you will try and win every deal you can at the beginning. Unfortunately, you'll end up with a bunch of customers. Some are a good fit for the future, and some are not a good fit. And you have to proactively remove those customers somehow. Because if you try and cater to both the old and the future, you'll dilute your energy, your money, um, your focus, and focus is key at the beginning. You have very limited resources. You have to make bets. So learning how to fire customers and to let go of the past is a really important part of scaling. You will not scale if you try to be everything to everyone, including the past that is less relevant and the future. When, when did you start firing customers? Was it at the very beginning, product market fit, or did, was that more important at these, the later, later stages, you get beyond 50 million in revenue? It's when, when you're in the tens, you find out that you're stuck with this really good group of clients and this less relevant one. And then you have this amazing dilemma because the less relevant customers pay cash. And we all like cash, especially now. <laughs> so they pay you money. At the same time, they take endless energy, especially if your entire roadmap goes another direction. 
So you try and keep them, but then you hurt the future. So you have this delicate dance that no one can decide but, but you, the person running the company, how much to keep this cash cow versus remove it. And to me, it's balancing energy and focus and time versus the cash you get from those clients. End of day, unless you're starving for cash and you're, you will die otherwise, I highly recommend to remove those clients because they will hurt your future big time. So finding this, you mentioned finding product market fit over and over and over again. Yep. It, it's this question I think that's, you know, it's not obvious. I think everybody understands that initial phase, you got to find product market fit. Everybody talks about that, getting to a million dollars of ARR. But it gets really hard when you get to be 50 million, 100 million, reinventing yourself. Thinking, how, how do you think about product market fit in that context? Like, organizationally, how, do you, how, do you, how did you figure that out? I think there's no name for it, but I would call it product go to market fit versus product market fit. Product market fit is there's a big market, you have a product, you have to adjust it until it fits somewhere in the market. But as you scale, it's about repeatability. It's about cost effectiveness. It's about CACL TV, right? How much it costs to bring a client versus uh, the money you get from those customers. And that's not about the product anymore. It's about the product and the go to market. And some of it is analytics, how much you spend and how much energy and time and money you spend to get a client, how much they stay with you. How can you optimize that? Maybe half the customers will pay 3x the cost. And that's a way better business, efficiency-wise. So to me, it's product go to market fit, not product market fit per se, because at the beginning, you care about the product, the go to market will adjust anyway. Right. So that's what I focus on later on. And the numbers do tell the story. CAC is king, CAC by channel, right? Customer acquisition cost, lifetime value, churn, net dollar retention. All those scarce words are really, really valuable when you scale to navigate. So you need your gut feeling and the numbers combined. And then you have trends. Will AWS offer a free product in this market? How can I adjust? Um, someone being acquired, usually an opportunity, because usually they get diluted in this big company and you can go and take their market and so on. So give us an example. Two very different businesses, Optimize and then SizeSense. Yep. When either around product market fit and what that meant, or just around scale, like what worked in one and didn't work in the other, what surprised you? Because it is, you know, it's, it's, it's not like it's the same story again. Sure. Actimize was selling to banks, and just for context, every, it was in the financial crime space, protecting fraud, money laundering, insider trading. Today, every second financial transaction on the planet goes through that system. Real-time transaction monitoring, analytics, etc. Um, average deal size, million dollar plus. Right? Those are big deals, enterprise sales. You pay them a lot of money, they bring you those big deals. Um, Sciasense was selling to tech companies and product companies, is selling, and embeds analytics in those products. Think about Zoom Info, Seismic, Outreach, and so on. Very different deal size, very different audience. Um, you deal with product leaders, not compliance and fraud and uh, cybersecurity people. So the sales process is totally different. The deployment process is totally different. One is in the cloud, one was in a banking environment, which is big and ugly and very slow to, to penetrate. So you have to build a totally different DNA to get into those organizations. And then the technology. At Sciences, we work with Snowflake in AWS, and Databricks, AI, machine learning. Actimize was big banks and regulations and Dodd-Frank and, and so on. So you build a very different DNA of people Marketing, everything you do is different. Did you try, at first, did you try to take some of those experiences from Optimize and apply them at SciSense and kind of learn the hard way? Or was that obvious to you? Uh, it was obvious it's different when the average deal size was a 1,000x <laughs> difference <laughs> at the beginning. Uh, at Optimize, our big challenge was going down market. There's only a, X many large banks, how do you go down market? At SciSense, was going up market from the SMB to the commercial space. Actimize was all outbound, account-based marketing. Sysense was inbound, leads, Google, um, um, SEO, etc. So it's a very different playbook. End of day, there's something identical. If you give enough value to a very clear buyer in a company, they'll buy your product. Right. That's the end of day, day. It's, it's the same. <laughs> so simple, so very simple. simple. Yeah. So we've talked about in, in scaling these businesses, you've said many times before, it's about the right team. 
It's about really getting the right team. And I think for everybody here in the audience, everybody knows it's all about the team. I think what's so hard though is translating that into what does that mean? Who do I hire? How do, you know, how do I figure out the right, the right people? Yeah. What are, give us some of the lessons you've learned about how you were able to build the right team, the right people to take on those businesses. My biggest insight, I'm now doing it 23 years, and I feel really old when I say that, but my first company was in 99. My biggest insight is every time you double your business in scale, so 10 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 80, you almost reinvent the company. The team, parts of the team, the go-to-market, the product go-to-market fit we discussed, and that's painful to, to really <laughs> accept because you find that, for example, the VP engineering, when you're building the product and scaling it early on, has a very different skill set required than when you're at 100 mil. And it's about running multiple development teams across the world, multiple product lines. Uh, CACD becomes you know, a very different challenge and so on. Your customer success is very different when you have very large clients um, down the road and are with you five, six, seven years, then early on you just land and on board and it's about building the initial machine. And unfortunately, or fortunately, some people rise to the occasion. And maybe a third I've seen in every team, like on average a third really rise to the occasion. A third you bring from the outside. You just don't have the talent, the skill set, the knowledge in the company. And a third is kind of luck almost. If you have them, you know them in the network. I like to hire from my clients. If you can hire an ex-customer, that's amazing, both validation and brings a lot of knowledge into the, the company. Uh, but you have to rebuild and refresh that team. On one hand, you want to give opportunities, and I, I love giving opportunities to people that will grow internally. At the same time, at some point, you have to say enough, we have to bring help from the outside. And that's a very delicate dance you have to do. Well, and, and speaking about you know, scaling people in a delicate dance, you've had to replace yourself as CEO. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that. I mean, that's, that's, a, you know, that's very hard to do. Lots of founders you know, find that challenging. Talk, talk a little bit about that, about how you thought about that at SciSense. So what we did not share, I fired myself twice. Um, so I'm a serial uh, quitter, I guess, by, by that. <laughs> once after nine years, once after eight years. So it's, it's been a while in both cases. But it's, it optimized when we reached about 200 million revenue, profitability, repeatability. I woke up one morning, and I'm not exaggerating, true story, I never said it publicly, and I met at a conference like this, one of my customers, and I knew the names of the customer grandkids. And I called my wife and said, something is terribly off. If I know this guy, grandkids, something is off. And I decided this is it, nine years is time, the company is doing well without me. That was the other realization, I took a week off um, and nothing happened. And I was like really proud and really upset at the same time. And I realized it's time. Uh, it was actually about after eight years. And then I told the board, I'm giving you 12 months, heads up, it's time. Um, the second time I did that, I did it better because I built a bench about two years prior. So after about seven, six and a half years, I started building a bench. And I hired both a CFO, using one of those replacements I mentioned, and a CPTO, a product and technology leader, both with the caliber that one day they can replace me. And I'm happy to say one of them replaced me, and one of them actually became a CEO of another company, and we just announced joined our board uh, as a board member. So to me, that's a great sign when you have that bench. Not everyone can have it. I know it's, it's, it's looked good on paper. It's not always possible. And early on, I wouldn't say you have the luxury to spend the energy building it. But after a few years, start thinking about it. It makes a gigantic difference in the likelihood of success if you have that bench. Going back to your comment about the grandkids that kind of gave you that aha moment, was it because you felt like you were too much in the details and it just couldn't scale? Or what, what, what was that moment for you that said, you know what, there's someone else that could do this better than me? I felt like we are on a good path and there won't be much difference in the next few years. Like we know what we're doing, we are on the right track. And I know too much that I'm not learning anymore. I love to learn, I love to, that's my own, you know, personality. And I felt like I'm reaching that, that end of the line. And truthfully, the company needed me less. So it was a good natural time to make a change. Yeah. Well, so building teams, it, it wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about culture. 
Because when you talk about recruiting people in and customers, you're sort of you know, adding to culture. So let's touch on that because I know for me as a venture investor, it took me years to really appreciate how important culture is. And I can't think of a single company in our portfolio that has scaled to 100 million and beyond that didn't have an amazing culture. And there's no right or wrong. There's no, this culture is great, this culture is terrible. Yep. They're different, but it, it turns out to be incredibly important. One of my biggest mistakes, and I'm talking about something that took me 20 years to really learn, maybe more, is that when you hire executives, there's many mistakes you do when you hire executives. The number one thing, the biggest red flag, if they will not be a strong culture fit, do not make the hire. It will not work. It's like a heart transplant with the wrong blood type. It just doesn't work. And I have been a victim of falling in love with someone in, in intellectual strengths or experience or even personality or saying to myself, I can really work with that person. I know my team will be pissed off, but I can, I can handle them. Doesn't work. That culture fit is, is, is a magical ingredient. Now, cultures do change. By the way, they change even if you don't want them to change as you scale. It's like kids. I have three kids. As they become teenagers, they get really annoying if you, even if you don't want them to get annoying. The culture does evolve and change without you wanting it to. But getting the wrong culture fit can accelerate that or take it to the wrong direction. And when you change multiple executives at the same time, which will happen to you, like it or not, then the risk of culture drift becomes significant. And if you make the mistake of bringing a few people from the same background, 3x Salesforce people, 3x Microsoft, whatever, in executive positions, they can hijack the culture. Now, this is not about good versus bad culture. I'm not saying they, they come from a bad culture into a good culture, just a different culture, and the company gets into this split personality uh, behavior, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to undo it and to recover from it. What, you know, I think people have a hard time interviewing for culture and trying to figure that. If you were to tell everybody here is that, you know, with their companies and they're thinking about hiring and they're trying to test for culture, what, what's a question you tell everybody they need to ask? How, how would you assess that? I, I don't ask questions. I create situations. For example, my, the person that used to be my admin became a chief of staff. His name is Vicky. She's amazing. She ran a restaurant before joining our company. And she has a sense for people better than most people. So I would just have them wait before they join me in the room for the interview. And they'll talk with, my, with Vicky. Um, they'll think she's my admin, but she was much more of a trusted advisor. And you would learn more how they treat that person than what they tell you formally. I like to meet people at weird times. Like, let's meet at 11 p.m. at the airport at the coffee shop at the entrance which is lousy coffee at the airport usually, and 11 p.m., no one wants to meet you and they're tired, but you learn more from that scenario of their true personality. We don't want to do that. We don't like the coffee. It's not, you know, not uh, sophisticated enough. You learn a lot if they're scrappy or not scrappy. So I like the situations more than the interview. I don't know how to interview for culture. I didn't find a magical question. When people think about culture, you know, I think people get hung up on this good, bad, you know, what, you know, when you think, were there different cultures that optimize versus oh, yeah. totally. size? How, how would you characterize the differences? Well, at Actimize, I wore a suit and a tie because I literally <laughs> work with banks every day. Every day I went to meet the compliance person. It, it was, and at SciSense, I, never, I, never, I don't know where my suit is. So uh, I was happy to take my genius out again. No, it's totally different cultures. Cultures are impacted by the founding team, by the customer base by the, 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 what drives the energy, what fuels the energy. Is it innovation or winning or conquering or whatever it is? So it's just different. Yeah. And it's okay. Team-based, performance-based. Yeah, it's all good. Uh, you just need to figure out what fits. There's no bad culture. There are bad cultures, but there could be many different <laughs> good cultures. Yeah. Well, Mira, thank you. We're, we're out of time, unfortunately. So quickly. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks thank to Amir. Thank you.